morning, everyone. I'm Kitty. I'm here to talk to you about NLP for online conversation. So can I get a show of hands? How many of you have visited a website and had a window like this pop up in the corner? That's just about everyone. Uh, these types of things are really common in online retail. They're really common on websites of universities where this is from. Uh, they're a record of conversation that has not existed in previous eras. This is another example of ways that conversation is recorded. Uh, I came across this a couple months ago when I was trying to schedule a happy hour at a bar near my office. It was the contact form on a bar's website, and there was not even a way for me to call them. Literally, the only way I could contact them was in a way that was mediated by text. And just to drive the point home, this is a text conversation with my mom. Uh, actually, overall, not a very interesting conversation, but it is a conversation that's mediated by text. This type of thing is its unprecedented in history. We wouldn't think to record something like small talk. I think about this type of thing a lot because I'm a data scientist at Reddit. Reddit looks a lot like this. It's a forum for hosting and participating in conversations about anything you want with people from all over the world. And there are parts of the site that are deep philosophical discussions, but there are also a lot of parts of the site that are small talk. Uh, this is an example of a post from Ask Reddit, which is one of our biggest parts of the site. And it was a post called, what does today you do for tomorrow you to make your life a bit easier? Overall, it's a pretty silly conversation. Uh, they're talking about like what it means to be a grown-up, you know, making sure you wash your underwear. It's, it's something that people would not have done serious data analysis on in a previous time. If I want to use data like this as a data scientist, I'm going to turn to a series of techniques called natural language processing. NLP, natural language processing, comes out of computer science and linguistics. It's been around since roughly the 1950s, and it is a way of transforming unstructured text data into something that can be plugged into a machine learning or statistical model. And to give you an example of what that process looks like, we're going to walk through this toy corpus. A corpus is any series of documents that you do data analysis on in natural language processing, and a document is a pretty general term. It can be a single sentence, like a Reddit comment, or like these sentences on this slide, or it could be something as complex as an entire novel, or it could be something like a legal document. This is a pretty basic example so that we can follow uh, what it means to transform a document end to end. The first step is to pre-process and normalize the text. And how you do that depends on your downstream task, but there are some very common steps that are shared by most pipelines. The first of these is to lowercase the string so everything is in lowercase characters. The second is to remove special characters. The third is to remove words with low information content, which are frequently called stop words. That's stuff like to, the, an, of, uh, sometimes it's pronouns. And then finally, you might stem or lemmatize words in the document, uh, which is removing prefixes and suffixes and re uh, reducing things to their base semantic form. What this actually ends up looking like with a sentence like, my brother likes to play guitar, is you first take the M in my, you turn it to lowercase, you remove a special character like punctuation or some other Unicode character, uh, erase it entirely. Then you remove stop words like my and to, and you stem or lemmatize the word plays into play. And you get brother like play guitar. It sounds kind of like a caveman, but as it turns out, computers are very good at understanding speech like this. The last form of transformation that you do, at least in a very basic NLP pre-processing pipeline, would be to create a bag of words. In a bag of words, every word in your corpus becomes a column. Every document becomes a row. And you one-hot encode the document where every word that occurs in the document is a one, and words that don't occur are a zero. And this gets you a lot. You can do document to document similarity. You can classify documents. You have a representation of what this document actually contains. And you don't have to do very much sophisticated feature engineering for this. You can do further refinements on top of this, such as the TF-IDF weighted bag of words. TF-IDF being an acronym that stands for Term Frequency Inverse Document Frequency. 
And at a high level, what that entails is you balance words uh, in your representation by weighting them based on whether they are frequent in your specific document versus how frequent they are in the corpus more generally. So words that are important to a specific document tend to have higher weights, which you can see uh, in an example like document number three, where you have loud having a higher weight than, well, actually it has the same weight in all of those, but it has a higher weight uh, than other words and other, corpor or other documents in the corpus. There have been even more refinements on top of this. This is my brother likes to play guitar as a word embedding. Word embeddings are something that came about in roughly 2013, uh, and they've really revolutionized uh, NLP. They take huge corpora, hundreds of thousands of words, and they create a matrix similar to the bag of words that we saw earlier, and then they perform dimensionality reduction that compresses this hundreds of thousands of columns into something much smaller, very frequently 300 columns. And what's sort of magical about these columns is they correspond to semantic concepts in the real world. Probably the most canonical example that you'll see in discussions of word vectors is the vector math that can turn king into queen or man into woman. What you can do with this is you can subtract woman or rather you subtract man from king and you get the word queen. You can do math with words and this gets you so much in terms of power and representation for natural language processing. And it doesn't just work with nouns, it also works with verb tense and many other things that you might care about. And what's even more incredible about all of this is this is available as an off-the-shelf tool. Most Python libraries that you can download today will have well, not most Python libraries, but natural language processing uh, libraries will have this built in. And you can leverage this without any effort on your part. But that brings me back to this Ask Reddit thread that I showed you earlier. It's pretty silly. It doesn't have a lot of very semantic, contentful words. It's small talk. And it also has some pretty unusual features that you wouldn't see in standard traditional NLP, which is done on things like newspapers or encyclopedias. The way people use language is very different and very expressive in conversation. So for example, you can see this person capitalizes the word before to make a strong emphasis. Or the person in the very last comment, they're using high five emojis. This is important information and I want to use it as a data scientist because it's going to tell me what people are trying to say and what they're trying to communicate. To drive this home further, I want to give some examples of these ways that these things that are thrown out by pre-processing pipelines change meaning. So in this first example, we have the sentence, I don't know, literally the exact sentence four different times, but with different punctuation. The punctuation really changes the meaning. Punctuation matters a lot. The same thing here. We have three different versions of the sentence. That's obviously what you should do next with different capitalization. The capitalization really changes the meaning. Capitalization matters. And this example kind of stands on its own. I don't really need to explain how the emoji changes the meaning of the word thanks. So if I want to leverage this, this paralanguage, uh, this is something that is roughly parallel to body language or facial expressions or tone of voice. It's something that happens digitally, but we don't really acknowledge. All of these things are forms of what I like to call digital paralanguage. And the forms that digital paralanguage can take vary greatly depending on what type of corpus you're working with. So sometimes the thread structure, who you're responding to, there's tons of meaning in that. Sometimes it's emojis, sometimes it's punctuation, sometimes it's the way people bold things. This really is going to depend on the corpus that you in particular are working with and how you leverage it. But it's something that can really change the way you understand your text data. But if you want to use this, you might not be able to use that pre-processing pipeline that's so tried and true. So what's a data scientist to do? I'm gonna to talk to you about a couple of different techniques for incorporating digital paralanguage with off-the-shelf tools that you might already be using today. The first of these is filtering. Filtering is a pretty low effort way of incorporating paralanguage. We have a new toy corpus here, 
and we're going to walk through a couple examples of how to use these different techniques. This first one uh, is a filtering approach, where let's say you're trying to build an abusive language detection model that's built on semantic features. It processes the first sentence. It classifies it as not abusive. The, friend is not, the word friend is not likely to be abusive. So the model doesn't think the sentence is abusive. But these other two sentences, the model thinks might be abusive. And let's say you've done some ad hoc analysis on your corpus. You've discovered that any document that has a word that is entirely capitalized tends to be an insult. You can take advantage of this information by looking at documents that are classified as abusive and do a filter on them. So we have two things that are classified as abusive, documents two and three and we run our capitalization filter check. Sentence two, there's no words that are entirely capitalized, so we correct our prediction and make it not abusive. Sentence three, we have two words that are entirely capitalized, so we're pretty sure it's abusive, and we leave our prediction as is. A second approach you can use to combining paralanguage features with semantic features like a word embedding is ensembling. Ensembling is a huge field all in and of itself, and getting too deeply into it is beyond the scope of this talk. But a way that you use it is you have multiple models trained, uh, possibly on the same features with different model architectures, or you could have different models trained on different features, but making predictions about the same outcome. We're doing the latter here. We have a paralanguage feature-based model and a word embedding-based model. We get predictions for abusiveness from each model, and then we combine those predictions somehow. There are a lot of different ways you can do it. You could use voting, where each model makes a prediction, and whatever prediction is most common becomes the final prediction. You could average the probabilities. You could do a weighted average if one model tends to be more reliable than the other. Many, many different ways of doing this. But this is actually an extremely effective technique. I've seen this improve model accuracy by almost 20%. And a final, probably highest effort of the solutions that I'm going to talk about today is leveraging a character level representation. And the way that works is instead of tokenizing on words like you do in a word embedding based model, you tokenize based on n-grams that are characters. So the top sentence on this slide is a word tokenization. And the bottom example is based on characters. This is far more flexible, uh, but it's going to have to be tuned to your corpus specifically. So you're probably going to have to build a pipeline uh, to pre-process this entirely on your own, which is, is not that difficult, um, but it does require some effort. And there are ways that you can do this fairly simply. For example, scikit-learn in Python, the word, uh, count tokenizer and the TF IDF tokenizer have a flag where you can opt to uh, make n-grams based on characters rather than words. And then you can plug that into a model downstream. Or you can even plug this into something like a deep learning model. The picture on the right side of this slide is from the well-known Andre Carpathy blog post, The Unreasonable Effectiveness of Recurrent Neural Networks, where he builds a character level recurrent neural network. And just by predicting the next character is essentially able to reproduce the works of Shakespeare. It's a very powerful way of representing text, and you can get very far with it. So today, we have talked about how NLP on conversational data is different. Conversational data does not have as much semantic content. It's more about feelings. We've talked about standard pre-processing techniques and the ways they remove digital paralanguage. And we've talked about how to combine representations of paralanguage by using filtering, ensembling, and character level representations of your text. And with these tools in hand, you can get the best of both worlds by combining paralanguage and semantic representations. Happy data munging. Thank you.